Ah, uh, yes. Hello and welcome back into the BetUS College Basketball Show for a Saturday. It is almost here. Championship week really is underway. The number one fingers are up right away uh, because all of the automatic bids, the barrage of 32 of them that will go out, all of that begins today, tomorrow, and all the way through next week. And we are here for you on BetUS TV. I am merely the somewhat competent host. T.J. Reeves. Handicappers are back. Big man on campus, Jeff Nadu. He's taken up permanent residency in his normal slot. Matty Cox also back aboard here for a Saturday edition of the program. Uh, we will say up front, the live button was flying yesterday with only moderate success. I can't promise the same fireworks today on the program. Uh, Jeff Nadu, we took some hits. We did get some wins uh, yesterday on the program. Opening thought uh, from you as we get things underway? Yeah, you know, I it's just kind of annoying, you know. I, I we just can't seem to get going with it, you know. I I know I can't, you know. I thought I started out really well yesterday, but you know, sometimes sports betting is is like a um an annoying girl at the bar that's with the girl you're trying to get with. You know, you feel like you okay. have something, everything's going great, and then you but get you this an annoyance. That, yeah, it's like a losing day. It just won't leave you alone. You know, it's kind of like a double team situation. There, yeah. somebody's fought through the screen, and you got a double team uh, <laughs> on on one of those. Uh, Matt Cox, welcome aboard. Uh, I don't know how punchy Nadu is going to be because it's Saturday morning, and he hasn't done this yet. We got to get in the groove because we got you know championship weekend. We got NCAA tournament games. We got the Final Four. We're going to be doing that on Saturdays. Matt Cox, welcome aboard. Thoughts on Friday? That includes a wild, dramatic Mountain West game where Boise State won in overtime late last last night. I know Jeff doesn't want to hear it for the under, but what a win for Boise State that keeps them alive for a share of the Mountain West title. We'll get into this as the show's going on. They did win an OT at San Diego State. Still alive, maybe even for the number one seed, possibly, in the Mountain West tournament. Matty, thoughts on Friday, in particular Friday night? Yeah, with uh, the big man as well, licking my wounds from uh, some tough L's yesterday. Uh, just a lot of randomness in these conference tournaments. We've seen it, right? Like the Pepperdine, they were up a million to zero in the first 10 minutes. Um, against Pacific, and then they score 53 points in a losing effort against San Diego last night. So the pendulum swings pretty volatile back and forth. I saw Javon Porter had put his name in the portal before he even completed the handshake line. So a lot of these teams, especially on the lower end of the totem pole in their conferences, you gotta, you're gotta you starting to see some white flag being waved. Um, and I think those are the teams you got to try to avoid. That's sort of what I learned over the last few days with these just All right. bizarre so we results. Talked- we did talk yesterday on the show, and it was a live button for Jeff and, and me about Missouri State hanging in with Indiana State. They did hang in, ifs and buts, for a little while, went dry on being able to score. And Indiana State was impressive. Now, they're going to be right back up on the floor this afternoon in the Missouri Valley. Uh, thoughts from both of you. Indiana State, do they, I mean, they have a decent net ranking in front of their name. Do they have an at large case? automatic bid would take all doubt away I- any thoughts here at least initially on how they looked yesterday and again they're coming in an early game here in a little bit yeah i thought they looked great i mean you know you look at this conference yesterday it really got i think all of us here on this show i mean we we all had we like we all like missouri state and you know belmont screwed us pretty bad i mean th- this has been a tough conference uh tournament i mean feels like maybe we should just bet the under that seems like the best bet in any of these games i will say um you know it's rare that you know, in a game that a, a technical foul a lot of the time kills it that much due to the fact that it's it's only one shot. But I tell you what, that technical foul yesterday by the big kid in, at Belmont, that, that literally screwed them. I mean, it, from then on, they didn't play well. Just the ugly last five minutes of that game. Um, you just can't have things like that. But, yeah, this he's right. The randomness of these things. I feel like, though, I have a decent angle with fading a team – that's been beaten twice already by a team. So, for instance, High Point, right? There's another team today on the schedule that I'm betting. And I'm going to tell you right now, I have to ask the people behind the scenes, how many games can you live bet here? Because <laughs> I am going out. I'm, I'm shooting, as I do. I'm shooting my pew, shot. Pew, baby. pew, uh, All right. Live, live button may be flying again today. Stand by for that. Uh, let's take a look at what we were on. And again, we, we, we could take a half hour to kind of recap yesterday and what we were on. We did have some winners. Jeff got a winner with High Point. Uh, Kyle A&T. got a winner with an under in the in the South Dakota Oral Roberts game. I got a winner with Tulane last night on a live button play as they put away Wichita State. 
Um, so there were some wins. You see we've dipped back down a little bit on the overall record, but there were many more plays yesterday, and it was an exciting show. The live chat, Matt Cox was going berserk yesterday with what we were live playing, what we were not going to live play. Temptation, stay here for the show. Get some live comments ready. We're going to have several games on the schedule for this Saturday, and then we'll get into your live Q&A here in a little bit. Are you boys ready? Because there's some titanic regular season closeout games in the power conferences, and that begins with this one, a rematch for the Houston Cougars, who have locked up the Big 12 a regular season title and the number one seed, but they still want a piece of Kansas. This is coming up this afternoon in H-Town with Houston laying eight and a half. The total is 137 for this game. Let's get it rolling with some discussion. Matt Cox, begin the discussion. We've talked a lot about revenge all week, revenge games. We're going to talk about it again today. Revenge for Houston at home. Some thoughts to get us rolling. Yeah, I think based on how some of these revenge spots have been playing, especially in the big conferences with, you know, real home courts, uh, it, you don't want to go against those. But some of the prices have been inflated to the point where you're not trying to lay the number either. I got bitten this last night with San Diego State against Boise. I thought it was kind of a prime Aztec smash spot. They got up, I believe, seven, eight second half and then couldn't quite extend. I think you've seen more of that actually the last week or so. I think these teams just as they get down the stretch don't quite have that fourth gear to put a team away. And obviously Kansas is no, you know, they're not going to fold quietly um, despite the the revenge angle on the mind of Houston. Also, the key thing with this, Houston's just not as deep as they were in the year. They got injuries up front. Javier Francis got banged up last game. Already down Joe Tugler. It, it's sort of the recurring theme with Kelvin Sampson. I think his teams tend to be a little bit too thin as they come down the final stretch of the season. I think they win today. I don't know if they cover eight and a half, though, against the, the Jayhawks, uh, even though they have the revenge angle going for them. Again, impressive for Houston. They've been banged up, Jeff Nadeau, but they came to Orlando, Central Florida, about 70 miles from me uh, in the middle of the state and were impressive in the last five minutes guarding what they've done all year long, put the game away, got the win, actually celebrated in the locker room for the Big 12 title, their first year in the Big 12. All right, so what does that mean for this afternoon in the revenge mode in terms of the angle here and also maybe the total for Houston and Kansas? Yeah, this total's been bet, uh, bet up. Uh, it's going up. I think a lot of people are kind of seeing at this point that, you know, although a great defense, Houston is uh, starting to leak a little bit. Uh, and a lot of it has to do with just they can't defend without fouling. Their foul rate is extremely high. Uh, you look at the first time these two teams played, it got to one uh, around 140, and there weren't even a bunch of foul shots in that game. We remember uh, Kansas really shot the ball well, but it really wasn't from three. They just bullied Houston really at every level. Um, Houston's foul rate, guys, is, is bottom 20 in America, I believe. That is just not good enough. Uh, they went over in seven of their last 10 games overall. I guess you have to wonder, as Matt's kind of talking about, and we kind of wonder, will McC uh, McCuller play? I mean, he's kind of been in and out. Um, although, you know, this game doesn't mean much in the grand scheme of things outside of a revenge, at least for Houston. You have to wonder who's going to exactly play for Kansas. I'm considering a live bet here uh, with an over, Ooh. but but I'm oh, <laughs> but, but I, I need McCuller, and that's the problem. And it, we don't know. And Matt, again, it's an think... afternoon game. Now he did play against Kansas State. He played a lot in that game. If you were watching, and I was watching towards the end of it because we talked about the game, he was hobbled a little bit. I mean, he wasn't acting. Yeah. He was hobbled, and they took him out. And the trainer was looking at him late in the game. You would think he's good to go. Now the significance again for Kansas is a win here would basically lock them into the fourth seed, I believe. That means potentially playing Houston again in the semifinal in Kansas City. So here we go into the machinations of how bad do you really want to win there? Do you maybe not want to be in line for Houston in a semifinal game if you can avoid it? you got to beat everybody anyway. Who knows? Previous matchup again was a 78-65 win by Kansas for what it's worth in the game at Fog Allen. All right, so there's some there's some banter back and forth in the live chat. Are you going to do anything with this right now, or do you want to contemplate it and wait later? I don't think I'm going to. I think, with, with, as you alluded to, with, with McCuller and some of the question marks, you know, I know Houston, although they didn't shoot the ball well uh, in the first game, the, the pace, I just, I don't know if it's going to be there in this game. You know, I don't think neither team is that, you know, Houston cares way more, I feel like, than Kansas. I'm going to pass, I think. All right. Uh, Houston, Kansas up at 4 Eastern time in the Fertitta Center, which will be rocking. 
uh, for their senior day, by the way. Um, and that is on ESPN coming up this afternoon. Again, we're live here on Saturday. Typically, we're here Monday through Friday at 11 a.m. But Savages, we're not going anywhere for Saturdays. Uh, I am looking so forward to what's going to happen with Championship Week. This is the first of a couple of mentions that I'll be working a couple of Championship Week games. I'll be in Las Vegas next Saturday morning live on this show getting ready to work the Mountain West title game. Stand by for that. So we're going to be here on Saturdays uh, here on BetUS TV. All right, let's get into game number two. And this one does not need a lot of buildup either. Revenge again on the mind of Kentucky on the road at Tennessee. The Vols have locked up the SEC regular season title and the number one seed in the tournament. They'd love nothing better than to sweep their rival. They are favored by seven and a half. The total is 165 and a half, which is a high total. But again, Kentucky, as we've said all year long, turnstile defense, revolving door. They don't seemingly guard anybody, including Vanderbilt the other night including Tennessee in the first game uh, that they played in Lexington. All right, Jeff Nadeau, start this uh, conversation off uh, with the with the talk of Tennessee hosting Kentucky. Yeah, I, I got to tell you, I, what what is what is Tennessee playing for here? I mean, I guess one, is it a one seed? A one, a one seed overall. A one, a one seed overall would still they're be in play. A, they're a one seed, okay, right now. I don't think if they lose a close game against Kentucky, they're not a, a one seed anymore. Um, they're, I think, looking forward to what's up next. This game means way more to me to Kentucky than Tennessee. I'll be honest. I thought Kentucky played. Look, we know what they are defensively. They're not great. Um, but without DJ Wagner, who scores about 11 points a game, they still hung tough in that game. Uh, Tennessee's looking for that double buy in the SEC tournament, or Kentucky's mm-hmm. looking for the double buy. With a Correct. win here, they're going to get it. This number opened nine. I got to tell you, I played it at nine. I bet it last night. Um, sadly, though, we can't do that on this show. We've got to get the number right now. At seven and a half, I'm going to add this one. I think it's too many points. Uh, seven points. Look, even if Tennessee wins, I still think this is too many points. Don't connect. We know how great he is. He could, you know, he, he could totally destroy Kentucky again, as he's done against a lot of teams. But with a big revenge angle, I didn't think they played that bad the first time, and they didn't have D.J. Wagner. A lot more to play for here to me for Kentucky as opposed to Tennessee. I'm going to add Kentucky plus the 7.5. It's still pretty Kevin, good. the live button is out. The live button is out for Tennessee volunteers for Jeff Nadeau, or for Kentucky at Tennessee taking the points in this revenge spot for Kentucky. It would be a large game if Kentucky can get it. It's obviously a quad one win on the road if they get it, further solidifying their seeding. I mean, there was talk a couple of weeks ago that Kentucky would maybe be like a 12 seed. I don't know that the talk was they would be in Dayton in the first four, Matt Cox. But, man, they've won some games, obviously, since then, against Auburn, against Alabama, um, et cetera. And so now a road win at Tennessee would further solidify them higher up the seeding chain. Matt Cox, some thoughts here. Kentucky at Tennessee. Well, I think the obvious look is the over, right? You just think about what these two teams have become this year, especially Kentucky, uh, playing like an NBA team, basically. Um, And then Tennessee coming off that war at South Carolina. Kind of got caught in a slog rock fight, which is what the Gamecocks do to you. Now they get to go back to their home building and play their game against Kentucky, who will handshake agree to run up and down all night long. Um, First game, 103 to 92. I don't think we see 103 to 92 again tonight, but uh, I think the projected total is actually a little bit short. Uh, I did take the over here. It feels like an obvious square play, but, um, you know, sometimes you got to think small to win big, as they say, Mr. Big Man. So I, I, I did take the over. I enabled it at 167. Pace should be really strong. Efficiency should be strong. I think this is a pretty easy over here. And, a game that, to your point, not that it doesn't mean anything, but it doesn't have the same meaning, I think, as like a game that was played a month or even a few weeks ago with, you know, SEC tournament lingering for this upcoming for next weekend, the Antilles tournament. I think this gets a little bit exhibition-y track meet on um, the second half. So are you, I don't see it official. Are you live button playing the over? Or you're just saying you took it no, on your own just, and you're not officially playing yeah, it on the show? Yeah, not officially playing it. No, I'm, I'm going to keep we the gotta live button. we got to clarify the live button mayhem on the program. You are not participating on the mayhem on this game. Potentially I, another game, but not I live button mayhem on this game. I have yet to participate this year in the live button. I feel like most of those are losers. Why so I'm, are trying you, to, I'm trying to keep us toward the winning 
portion. The why are you here. still hesitant? You've got to dive in. But that's for why the live he's, button. But 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 remember, that's why he's. I believe six games above five hundred. I'm still correct. scarred from last year. I'm still scarred. Yeah. And sh- I understand, from last year, big guy. But if anything that you've seen so far, there is no shame in losing with the live button. That's virtually all that it's done. To this oh, point. is there a so, is there an insurance policy on the live button plays? We we, to, there, to there's not a refund policy, but uh, there could be an like insurance that. policy. Uh, but in any event, uh, for this one day, just worth noting, the game was in the 60s the other night at South Carolina with this total at 160 whatever, 160, 166. I think wow. I saw. All right, yeah, to, I, totally I understand it's Kentucky, it. but I mean, look, look at the game uh, at uh, at Alabama last Saturday night. It's 81-74. So that's nowhere close to 166, obviously. Interesting, too, and this got brought up in the live chat, Tennessee's team total is 87.5 or 88 on the BetUS line. What do we make of that uh, at home? Will they need to score 88 to win the game But But I'm just being, today? I'm just being honest, okay? But, Matt, if you're uh, Barnes, right? I mean, they've locked up the one seed, okay? They're a one seed in the tournament. What are you playing for here? You're playing because it's a rivalry and a chance to sweep them, and it's senior day. Those are three they things. They don't that, have the one seed all but sewn up, though, Jeff. Like, I, I still think Arizona could maybe catch them. UNC could maybe catch them. I, I think I like, they probably have it, like, very safe. But um, you lose this one if you drop the early one in the SEC. But this thing, you number. You falling to the, to the high end two seed. This number just seems high. You know, it I, high. I, It's very high. You know, four or five, maybe, but seven and a half. Nine. He's playing it. He's playing it at seven and a half with Kentucky again, 4 p.m. Eastern time. Live button play. Jeff on the Wildcats. CBS TV from Thompson Bowling Arena. Let's see what happens there. You see, we got a couple of more games that we are discussing, and then we'll get to your live Q and A. We got time here on Saturday. A lot to get to, and there's action starting already at noon Eastern time all over the place. All right, this one humongous in the ACC for North Carolina and Duke. Marquee game every year. Every year ESPN shows this one on the last regular season Saturday. It is from Cameron Indoor Stadium on the Duke campus. Duke favored by five and a half and the total 150 and a half. Revenge again. Here we talk revenge because in these rematches, always somebody has won the first one. So somebody else has got revenge. The revenge in this case is Duke. Duke having lost at Carolina about a month ago. All right. Uh, interesting that the one seed is still up for grabs right now, I believe, in the ACC. You could correct me if that is uh, incorrect here at this point. Duke in the revenge mode, favored at home. Let's get the discussion underway. Jeff Nadeau, thoughts about this marquee game tonight? Yeah, I mean, let's just be honest. Duke got punked in the first game. I mean, they looked horrible defensively. Um, it was an ugly one. They couldn't get stops. It was hard to watch. Um, That said, I mean, their offense didn't look half bad. Um, They've got to get better defensively. Um, We know this is a two-team race in this conference. Uh, Outside of them, uh, maybe you throw Clemson or one other team in there. But this is a great game. You know, good teams, both top ten. I'm actually going to add another play here. I'm going to go under the total. I think it's too high. Something (laughs) Something tells me this game is played in the low 70s. I think we take a throwback a little bit towards the defensive angle. Look, one thing I've said all season, and one thing I've been very impressed by, is how good UNC's defense has been. They have made a complete 180 as a program on the defensive end. If I told you, or if I told myself that they'd be a top six, seven team in defensive efficiency in the entire country, I would have told you you're crazy. They have done a great job on that end. They have been the best defense in this conference. And I'll tell you what, I think Duke is starting to kind of maybe figure it out a little bit defensively themselves. I know they haven't exactly played a murderer's row recently, but you know they've held teams really in check on that end. I think we see a, a, a kind of a back and forth, kind of an ode to one of the games 10 or 12 years ago where this game is kind of 72, 68, 74, 70. I think 150 and a half is a little too high. I think we see a good game here where possessions matter. Give me the under 150 and a half. That is a live button play for another one here. Second straight game that Jeff Nadeau's going live button with the under. Matty Cox, as he mentioned, the first game was 93-84. I got a couple of numbers uh, for you. Duke right now has won outright eight of the last nine. 
And in all eight cases, they've covered as the favorite in the win. The one game they didn't win, they obviously didn't cover at Wake Forest, the controversial hey, court storm game. Yep. One, one other point I just want to make. Although this year's game was high scoring, look at the two matchups last year. 63-57, 62-57, right? Right. I mean, it, I'd love another game like that. I'm going to get close of course. to it. That'd be beautiful. Of course, but again... Again, Duke has gone eight and one straight up and against the number in the last nine, being favored in all of them. All right, Matty Cox, any thoughts on Duke in revenge? Senior night again for the uh, the Duke Blue Devils tonight um, in Cameron. Always a nuts rivalry for sure, crazy rivalry. Thoughts, Matt Cox? I do like Duke. I, at five, it's a strong lean. I'm not going to make an official play, though. I think at four, I would have maybe jumped, jumped on the live button with Mr. Big Man. I, I love the under, though. Like, you look at the last meeting between these two. After the game, Shire was relentless on transition defense and how porous they were against UNC. I think he makes that a point of emphasis this week. I think you see far fewer fast break opportunities. And you look back historically, Shire, since he's been the coach, right, last year, this year, I don't have the updated figures for me this season, but last year he was one of the strongest second half under coaches teams in the nation. He tends to really play and accept a possession nip and tuck type game. If the game is close late in the second half, much like how he operated as a point guard, where he played a lot of those Duke teams were among the slower that coach case had. I think you see that same type of um, approach with how he approaches these kind of closer games. I mean, look like last four, last five, every game has been under 65 possessions. So I kind of like Duke turning toward more of an under team, especially with Proctor back and healthy, who, despite some of his shortcomings on offense this year, he is a lockdown defender and very useful uh, piece to throw on Davis and some other guards they have. Also, if I'm Shire, I would have been pissed off because this team nationally, fourth nationally, in defensive uh, defensive possessions uh, allowed transition. So basically, how many initial field goals are in transition? Only 21% of their initial field goals are in transition, which is one of the better marks. As I said, they were not good. You can't allow transition against Carolina, and they generally don't. TJ, I think you're going to play this one live, too, and I think that bodes well towards your play. All right, here we go. There's another interesting stat. I am full of a lot of things. People would just say I'm full of it. Uh, A year ago, John Shire had four situations, big man, pay attention, where it was revenge in the ACC. Care to guess what his record was in the four revenge games? I'll go four and zero. How about all four were covers as well? This is the first situation where they have had a revenge after a loss. They lost a pit earlier in the year. They haven't played them again. They beat Wake Forest in the first game, so it was not revenge when they lost, obviously, to Wake Forest. This is the second. This is the only revenge spot this year. There would be a second one if they play Pitt in the ACC tournament. I'm going Duke. I'm going live button right here to get it done at Cameron in revenge. Lay the number. The host says lay the five and a half. I'd have been happier at the four and a half this morning. It's now up to five and a half. When we locked it in on the show, I'll still lay it anyway. I mean, for God's sake, I went down with Missouri State and with Dayton last night. I'm ready to go down with Duke if if it's the case on the live button. Live button play. Duke laying the five and a half, and the big man also live button playing the under. And what are you getting on the Bet US line? What's that under? 156? Uh, one, one, 150 and a half. 150 and a half. You'd love it to be 156. 150 and a half for the under. Thinks the game is something like se- or low 70s to the upper 60s. You'll take that uh, as well. Again, thank you in the live chat. Uh, by the way, the Savages are disagreeing with you. They think this is over, over, over. We'll see who's right tonight. Hello. We'll see what happens on ESPN 6.30 or thereabouts. ESPN loves to play around with the start times of these games because the other games are running long. This one's supposed to start somewhere around 6.30 Eastern time from Durham, Cameron Indoor Stadium. Let's see what happens uh, tonight with Duke and Carolina, the latest meeting. By the way, in their last 100 meetings, it's like 51 to 49. Carolina leads like 51 to 49. And the points scored is almost identical, like 1,800 something to 1,800 something. It's been an incredibly even rivalry for like 25 plus years. All right, latest installment is tonight. Two more games to go. Your live QA is coming up here on this Saturday edition. All right, let's go to the Sunbelt Conference tournament unfolding. And James Madison has been a tremendous story in the Sunbelt. Uh, So far this season, obviously, the early season opening win against Michigan State. They are laying 12, neutral floor, Pensacola, Florida. 
uh, in this matchup with Marshall. Total is 153 in this matchup. Jeff Nadu, we are back to you. Yet another official play. Perk up, peeps. Jeff is on a play. I thought you hated this conference, and yet <laughs> you're looking at the Sun yeah. Belt on a neutral floor. What's up? Yeah, I bet this one last night at ten and a half, and I thought to myself, you know, I don't think I played a Sun Belt game all year, um, but I really like this spot for James Madison here. Um, numbers been bet up to twelve. I still think it's a little too low. You look at JMU beat Marshall this year by twenty six and by fifteen. They ran rough shot in both games since September or since February first. Um, Essentially, before they that they had lost to App State. Since then, they've been on a mission. Uh, they're winning games on average by about 15 points a game. They've just been mulling this conference, and they seem like a team with a real chip on their shoulder. Uh, yet to figure they'll probably face App State again at some point here. Uh, but they got to get through Marshall first. Marshall won uh, the other day against Georgia State. It was a weird win for them. Um, they made 14 of their 29 threes, which for this group is crazy. I mean, they shoot about 31% on the season. It was one of those outlier games. This game is reminiscent to me of yesterday's game with High Point and Radford. I think it was a team that really just didn't belong there in, in their second game. They faced a really good team and got blown out. I think Marshall gets up for this one. You also... I don't think play a place uh, pace Marshall that's conducive to JMU. I think JMU is going to have a bunch of possessions in this game. They're very efficient. I think they win like 85, 66. I'm going to lay the number here with JMU, a team that I think is on a mission. All right. Terrence Edwards Jr. leads them in scoring at 18 a game. Neutral floor. We've, we've gone over this, Matt Cox, a couple of times about teams that have played a game already on the neutral floor, which Marshall has against a team that's been waiting like James Madison has been waiting. Uh, and this one is the last game of the four games. This is tonight for the two seed on the last game on the floor. James Madison, the two seed thoughts on Marshall and JMU. Well, yeah, the good thing here is that they've had an extra day off, right? A lot of these tournaments that go playing around back-to-back -back next day against that top-seeded tier. This one, at least get the Friday off um, you know, to rest. I think it's a pretty big edge for the dogs, in this case, Marshall for sure. And it's a team that usually has a lot of depth under D'Antoni, but this year they're not as deep. It's just kind of a different type of roster construct. Um, they do have lots of length, and I do. They, they've had trouble matching up with JMU in the regular season. I think JMU's kind of spread out attack has caused fits for this team, but Dan Tony seems to be convinced that they're playing hard and that they're on the verge of breaking through. Uh, saw some signs of that last round in the opener, but obviously James Madison, different beast. I think it's competitive tonight. I, I really do. I do like, feel like JMU the last few weeks has been um, leveling off uh, per se, I think playing closer to their competition, not beating teams by the margin that we saw earlier in the year. So I kind of like the angle uh, catching a dozen here as the, as the dog with the day off. All right, again, as uh, Jeff alluded to, they played twice in the regular season, and James Madison won by 14 or more in both of the games. You got to lay 12 here. I know the chat is going crazy about James Madison um, and, and their opportunity here. All right, uh, big man says lay it tonight with the Dukes of JMU. He will lay 12 points in the Sun Belt quarterfinal game. Again, championship game will be Monday night in Pensacola. Appalachian State is the top seed. Appalachian State is up on the floor first, uh, coming up in their quarterfinal game with Georgia Southern. That might or might not come up in the live chat, but they're up first at 12.30 Eastern time, 11.30 local time. Panhandle of Florida is uh, largely in the central time zone, so that's an 11 30 local start for Appalachian State. The game we're talking about here is Marshall James Madison, 7.30 p.m. tonight. ESPN Plus has these games in the Sunbelt Conference where it's an, it's an interesting setup for Appalachian State and James Madison and somebody uh, else that may get in the mix for the automatic bid. All right, some good conversation on that. One more game to go on our schedule, your live Q&A. Uh, coming up, participate on some games that we haven't talked about uh, yet. Let's go to the Southern Conference, the SOCON. Furman and Western Carolina. This playing out uh, here in the SOCON tournament, which is what? In Asheville. This is you in uh, C. Asheville's arena, not them playing in this conference. They're in a different conference. So this one coming up in Asheville at the Harris Cherokee Center. Uh, here and this is the last game on the floor of the quarterfinals in the SoCon tonight. Western Carolina and Furman. You see, it's a pick'em game with a total of 147. Matt Cox has the handicap. 
Uh, official live play coming. What do we like in the Southern Conference late tonight? I like the men in fur. Furman, the, the Paladins, they're just a, uh, a a team that's starting to kind of figure themselves out down the stretch here. It's, they had Alex Williams, one of their key players, out due to suspension. They've got him back the last three games. Bob Ritchie finally broke through in this format last year after having success in the prior years. I just think it's a team that's set up for a big, deep run. I also like that they just played Western Carolina and lost to them, so it's close to like that immediate revenge type of angle, which has shown um, the data has shown that to be somewhat uh, pr- predictive in the right spots historically. Now it's all case by case. You got to kind of pick and choose your battles with those types of of angles. But I think in this spot, off two losses um, after they were kind of set into that fixed spot in the bracket. I think those last two losses you've seen Furman were more just like, eh, we know where we are. The tournament's all we really have as a path to the tournament. I think they turn it back on today. And their results all year in conference have been really good against the best teams in the biggest moments. They've had letdowns, but it's win or go home today. They just need to win to cover the spread. I think they beat the Catamounts here today. Uh, Jeff Nadeau, we've talked about the kid J.P. Pegues. He's the one that beat Virginia last year in the first round of the NCAA tournament with the three ball after the incredible bonehead play where Virginia gave the ball up. They got the ball to Pegues. Pegues hit the go-ahead three. Furman knocks out Virginia in the opening round. Pegues has, has been a tremendous scorer, but uh, they've had some struggles. So this is a fairly even game, neutral floor tonight. Thoughts on Furman, Western Carolina, SOCON tournament? Yeah, I think Matt's handicap is 100% right here. I mean, I think with with Furman, you know, I think by, let's say, January, you kind of know where you stand. All that matters is the SOCON tournament, and, and this is where you have to turn it on. Uh, it doesn't matter what your record is. The goal is to win this tournament and get to the NCAA tournament. Um, so I don't put a lot of stock on what they did over the last four or five games. Um, this is a Western Carolina team that probably played too well over the last couple of games, and maybe they just might bow out early. It seems like that's kind of the norm under them in, in this conference. I like his handicap. Pegues was uh, terrific all season. Even at 35 points the other night, it seemed like he was the only one that seemed to care about that game uh, if you were Furman. But, yeah, I think Matt has the right handicap here. Essentially just having a win, uh, I think it's a good spot. Furman does just seem to find ways. I think it probably sets up a a, a fanfare matchup at the end against Sanford, a team that they've uh, played uh, you know, pretty well against this year. So, Again, for Furman, I'm looking the Western uh, Carolina recent loss was by eight there. They did win the home game with them 66-62. So it's a split in the regular season. And Pegues can heat up, Matt Cox. I know you know this. Uh, that in that Samford game that they lost on the last second shot, Pegues had actually given them the lead with a three, and that was part of him scoring the last 19 points of the game by himself for Furman. I say again, my man, there are Nadu heaters, and then there's a Pegues 19 points in a row to end the game, only to be beaten on the last second shot. Will he have a big night tonight for Furman? The Paladins. What did you call them a second ago? I usually the make Paladins. fun of Corby. I know. I was the, the Paladins. It's, sort of it's the like Paladins. a mythological knight from Dungeons and Dragons. You also called them the uh, the Fur Men. The Men in Fur. The Men of Fur. The men of fur. That, the men that's of their fur. actual nickname. That's the proper nickname. Yeah. The Men of Fur. Whatever you want to call them, he says, take them on the money line. Pick them tonight. It's a pick them pick. Take them. Uh, tonight, take Furman in the Southern Conference, 8.30 Eastern time tonight. Last game on the floor out of their four quarterfinal games. Uh, Samford is at the top of the bracket. They play first this afternoon. Uh, Samford and Bucky McMillan, do they have an at-large case? Eh, they need to probably make sure and win this tournament. They play Mercer this afternoon at noon, coming up in about an hour and a half. This game we're talking about on screen that Matty Cox is taking Furman in is the last game on the floor in Asheville, North Carolina. Coming up tonight. All right, we've given you five games that we're talking about. Here's the cool thing about this show is we're about to get into live Q&A. We'll try to get to as many games as possible. Regular season ending in the Power Six conferences and some of the mid-majors as well. We haven't even talked American Conference yet. Jeff Nadeau, Matt Cox, stand by. There's a huge one coming up for Memphis and Florida Atlantic in a little bit. Let's see who's in the Q&A here and see who's got stuff for us. You see we're here weekdays, 11 a.m., Saturdays, 10 a.m. on BetUS TV, and we're excited uh, about that. All right, so tons that people want to ask about. Let's get into it. Helms is watching. Thank you, Helms. He says, thoughts on Northeastern getting two against Stony Brook. He is leaning Northeastern in that matchup. Any thoughts from either one of you immediately on that side? I see you nodding, Matt Cox. Yep. 
I'm on the Huntington Hounds, as they call them, up in uh, up in Boston. Yeah, I think Bill Cohen, I, Coach who has had some tough times, let's put it nicely, the last couple of years. A ton of injuries. Starting to get it figured out this season, but the key, the, the key piece here is Lucas Sakota. I believe he's supposed to play today, uh, but has not practiced, and they have not won a conference game without him in the lineup. So I think it's a lot riding on that part of the handicap. Um, but I'm betting on him playing, him being at least 50% of what it usually is. And I think Bill Cohen in conference tournaments, um, kind of a he's underachieved this year, I think, with the talent he's had. I think they kind of played a little bit of a higher rating in this conference tournament format. So I did take the uh, the, the Huskies here. Jeff Nadu, anything on Northeastern here this afternoon with Stony Brook? Yeah, Stony Brook's been pretty good this year under Geno Ford. Uh, but that said, I- I'll always lean on a Bill Cohen in, in a kind of coin flip matchup. Um, don't have much on this one, though. Um, I-, I made my money in the CAA yesterday. I'll, uh, well, I didn't make money, but I made it in this conference. I'll pass on this one, though. All right, so a pass for him on that. I was looking for the game time on that one in the CAA uh, quarterfinals. But in any event, you got some thoughts on Northeastern and Stony Brook. Uh, Dean says, gentlemen, can I have an opinion on Texas A&M? How many more times is somebody going to ask for the opinion on Texas A&M? And I say they're bad. Yeah, I don't. I know I, I know they did win against Mississippi State uh, midweek. Thought on Texas A&M closing out the regular season here in the SEC. Anything on that from either of you? I know oh. there's marquee games, and then there's a and Yeah, I, th- I think this is kind of a preview of an NIT uh, kind of game here. I mean, both these teams have, have played their way out, I think, uh, of the NCAA tournament, if you will. Um, I will say, I mean, Ole Miss is, has been, you know, good at times, and then they've looked just bad. They've been really bad, though, since February 1st. Look, I always say if, if A&M plays a team that can't defensive rebound – I'll play A and M. Um, Ole Miss is one of the worst rebounding teams in the country, particularly on the defensive end. Um, that could be a field day for A and M here. That that's very concerning. Uh, throw in the fact they did lose the first time, um, but uh, this is a game on the road. Just if I'm anyone looking to bet this game, just go to something else. What? What? Why? I mean, yeah. Why, what are we doing here? And who's yeah? And they, these are these are middling teams in the SEC that do not have an at-large case. Matt Cox, anything real quick, including maybe the total, or do you just want to stay away? Totals one forty-two and a half. Ole Miss hosting A and M this afternoon. Uh, just an injury note there. I believe Matthew Morell is out today for Ole Miss. Pretty mm-hmm. critical creator and shot maker there for an offense that uh, is a little bit too reliant on shot making this year. You would think Chris Beard at the helm they would run um, stuff to get easier buckets, but a lot of their offense has been extremely predicated on just tough shot. That's why they haven't been very consistent uh, away from home or just throughout the year in general. So I, I kind of lean the other way, actually, given that wrinkle and in the injury. Fair enough on that. All right, up next, MCSA says, TJ, we have to talk USF. Let the record reflect, and they do. We're 38 minutes into the show. They are playing this afternoon. I didn't bring it up, but you know what? Again, in honor of Mrs. Reeves being an alum, the hat is going to go on here for this conversation south florida at tulsa looking to finish 17 and 1 in the american conference they are laying in the rematch here we go with revenge again four and a half i was at the game in tampa where tulsa went through two long scoring droughts in tampa and it basically did them in they went through like an eight minute scoring drought in the second half and it was over south florida made some shots made some threes early on in the game any thoughts from either of you total 145 and a half two central time in tulsa usf again is locked up the one seed uh for the conference tournament and the regular season title so here we go again with motivation but they also know boys don't slip up and screw this game up against a team that's like 175 or 200 in the net ranking any thoughts from a handicapping standpoint what is the number in this game the number is four and a half for tulsa we we kind of hear like they can't slip up, they they can't lose this game. They don't. I mean, they've won every game, South Florida. They they've had bad spot after bad spot put in front of them. I mean, and they've found a way. I mean, I go back to that game. Um, what was it last Saturday against Charlotte? Charlotte, a game they had probably no business winning. I mean, it was a great spot for Charlotte, and this group just found a way. 
Um, South Florida is not just good against the spread. They're good as good against the spread really at every level. They're also 11 and four as a favorite against the spread. Um, I think if you're Tulsa, your goal, I think at, at this point is just getting to the NCAA or uh, the uh, AAC tournament and seeing what you can do. I think South Florida seems like a team on a mission. Um, Lay it. I'll, I'll add it. South Florida minus Ooh. four and a half. Uh, you oh. have to. I mean, this is a, a team that just has answered the call every single time. Again, 15-game win streak, and in that 15-game win streak right now, they are 12-1 or 11-12, 1-2 against the number. Only one time have they not covered so far. Only one time a loss uh, in that situation. So they have been really good. Um straight up and also against the number and Jeff's going to live play South Florida on the show. Mrs. Reeves is bulls. Happy wife, happy life. Matt Cox, anything else here? How much danger are they in? Although, as he's pointed out, they they've handled these situations the last couple, three times on the road and outplayed the road team. Yeah. Very impressive because the league itself has been one of the stronger home courts. Uh, it's one of those that got rejiggered ge- different geographical territory teams, making new trips to new places it's a big, sprawling conference, and all the home courts are good. Like every program here, you know, draws pretty well. Teams just play very well at home. So to do what they've done on the road has been what's so impressive. That's why they've basically climbed into at large consideration here. Last game of the year, I think they get it done. Tulsa's good. I think a lot better than their record shows. I've been kind of in on this Conkle reclamation project. Last year was a disaster, like calamity. This year been much more competitive. Um, but the market's been a little bit too eager to fade the South Florida steam and i think if you just wait to bet south florida each game you get a good price right from open to close wait closer to tip the last few weeks you've gotten the best value the best of it with the bulls and you cover pretty much every game so i think you just stay with that approach it's probably gonna come down to four maybe if you keep waiting um interesting tip. real quick so, um yeah go ahead i just want to point something out um in relation to this conference, Tulsa played recently against Temple University, and Corby Craig and I, he was mentioning yesterday that no one really talks about this, but the total in that game, there was a huge move. Uh, and we have to wonder again, any game right. involving Temple is very oh, questionable yeah. at this it's, point. Um, all right, we're yeah. going to get into that in just a second, so let's finish up on the live button on this, and then I want to talk the Temple stuff while we're here. The live button play again is South Florida laying the four and a half on the bet us line. Correct. Live button play Jeff Nadu. Yes. Correct. Yes. On this for Mrs. Reeves bulls who are already the number one seed in the American conference coming up uh, in Fort Worth, Texas. What a wild conference that's going to be. So we'll talk more about that in a second. I'll take the hat off here on the play on that. So on the temple situation, we talked about this yesterday. It was an American conference game. On Thursday night, where UAB scored 102 points on them. And so now the the letters you don't want to hear, the FBI is now involved, along with a watchdog group that oversees the sports books, both uh, nationally and internationally in this country called U.S. Integrity. They are a cyber gambling uh, watchdog group. They alerted a bunch of the sports books Thursday night about the ridiculous line movement and to stop taking action on this game. And Temple just absolutely no-showed in the game. So now a further dive, Jeff. You mentioned the Tulsa game recently. Huge line movement in that. Same thing. Temple not guarding, not rebounding. Seemingly a giveaway. Further examination that Temple in the American Conference has had a stretch where they have not covered like 11 times in 13 games. And now you've got to go back and start examining over and over again how many times were they not guarding in the second half of a game where suddenly the spread is covered. That's what happens in these situations. Jeff, other thoughts? You're in Philadelphia, and it is a huge local regional story in Philadelphia and may get bigger and bigger nationally today and this weekend with Temple. Yeah, I, I definitely think it's clear that, that something went on here. Um, you know, I, I know Corby, a lot, a lot of us look into this stuff. Matt, I mean, we all, Kyle, everybody knows when you see something, especially late in the season, a line should not move five, six points with yeah. no redeemable reason. That, that just shouldn't happen. Who is the integrity um, body? We, we didn't need them to. US, we, 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 we could all see it without their. their U.S. Thank integrity. Well, but again, yeah. again, these are the companies. Um, these are the sports books relying on this company. They're like the gold standard. I'm giving them a free plug. They were alerting people on Thursday at like six Eastern time. Stop taking action on this game. This Here's is ridiculous. Oh. 
the amount of money being bet on UAB, something is up. And again, uh, for Andy Fisher, the coach, they're going to have to go back and be answerable, watch game film, et cetera, if there are guys not trying. Let me tell you where this is leading to, all right? Let's just be honest on BetUS TV. This is leading to either a staff member, players, some combination that are in on this, somehow either them gambling or somebody on their behalf gambling on these games, and the word got out recently and got out big time on UAB. Yeah, but, That's TJ saying this. It's going to lead but, back but to somebody the on the inside. You, you might be, you're, you're going to be right, and it likely does. The thing is, this number moved with huge money. It wasn't with kids at, That's right. at Temple betting. Um, here's the thing. I think what will happen, the FBI is involved, which means that Correct. it probably looks like a more organized group, uh, which, again, remember, the federal crime is only uh, – that only covers uh, this sort of thing. There's not a state law against this. That's Throw right. in the fact that um, if, if a player is involved in this team and let's say they were approached by somebody and they, let's say, were bullied into doing something – um, you know, they're not going to be charged. That said, if someone on the team influenced others, they can be charged federally. Look back to the 1979 Boston College point shaving scheme That's involving correct. the Lucchese crime family. That was one individual, Rick Kuhn, on the team who tried to influence others to fix games. Now, I'm not insinuating that people fix games here, but I don't believe they're the only team either. I, I think there's other teams uh, involved right. in this, too. So let's let's be clear on a couple other things, and Matt, I'll let you get back in, and then we're going to move back to handicapping the games today. So a couple other things. This has happened over and over again. Tulane, later in the 80s, had a point-shaving scandal. It involved later an NBA player named John Hot Rod Williams that you might know the name of. They disbanded their basketball program for two or three years after the scandal. 1990s Arizona State had a similar point-shaving scandal um, and got them in all kinds of trouble. It actually got Bill Frieder fired, the former coach fired, I believe, in the mix of all of that scandal. All right, so this is nothing new and original here, and there's high suspicion that this has been going on. And just to repeat what I was referring to is what happens is there are a couple of people involved, and then the word gets out everywhere. I'm not saying that the individuals involved bet tons of money, but the word obviously got out everywhere about go against Temple. Go against Temple on the total, go against them on the line, and that's why you saw the line movement that was happening. I said a lot. Matt Cox, final final thought on this discussion about the Temple investigation ongoing. Yeah, I get, clearly it wasn't one group that bet it all the way to eight, right? They probably bet it from two to four or something, which is you know, that, that happens more commonly. You can certainly hide that. But then when it goes from four and a half to eight, I think that says one person told someone, one person figured it out. Or you just look at, okay, hold on. This guy's gone from two to five. We've seen Temple in two other games here, by the way. Two other, like the Memphis game was really bizarre. Just late at the buzzer steam for no reason. And they were down like 20 points in the first 10 minutes. Um, you know, honestly, if I looked at that again in hindsight, easy to Monday morning quarterback it, but like, Probably should have hopped in when we saw five six. Like, okay, happened before, you know, raise an eye. Whether it's point shaving or the team has just quit, obviously the former is more of a certainty. But even the latter, we've seen teams really just fold down the stretch pretty hard. So, like, if you can just identify those teams, you know, they may not be explicitly right. point shaving, but mentally they're kind of checked out, and that's kind of the same dynamic. So it's you know, th- there's a way where you can kind of ho- you could have hopped on the back end of that and come out clean just by reading the body language of the team, how they've right, been playing the last few weeks. This and just, stay tuned. Yeah, go ahead. This just adds to the added embarrassment to a one-storied university. At every level, Temple University is inept. Um, they have not been able to protect their students. They have not been able to uh, you know, hire the right coach after a friend. Dump. It's just been a complete embarrassment as a university. Uh, and, it, right. and again, is a laugher because – you know, people in the city know what's up with Temple. They're All lost. right, so one more time, they are investigating, and Temple is to play upcoming in the American Conference Tournament, probably a one-and-done against whoever they're playing, but this investigation is going on. Let's see what they can find out in the next two or three days. And Andy Fisher, the coach, it's Andy Fisher, right? He's Adam the coach. Fisher. Adam Fisher, excuse me. He's got to be answerable, too, to some of this on what's going on with your team. And it, has your team been up to something and purposely not trying to rebound, not trying to defend, and paying attention to how big the line is or not? Let's see what gets answered. A lot is out there. More to come on that. So we spent a lot of time on that, but it's important for what we do here. Uh, and that was their last regular season game. 
uh, with UAB uh, there the other night. All right, quickly, back to some of the other games. Elias is watching. Elias says thoughts on Wake Forest and Clemson with a total of 149.5 playing out the ACC regular season. Any thought here, guys, quickly on that? Yeah, no, nothing profound here. It's these late season power conference games, I sometimes just don't really, I, I can't get a good read on them, to be honest. So, uh, you know, Wake Forest, man, what a turbulent last week or so had opportunities to get on the right side of the bubble. Just have me able, I, I feel like they could be sort of in a mental state of fragility right now, too. I definitely can't trust this team. Um, I do like the over, though. I, I, I kind of feel like there's a lot of points in this game. Defense optional. Wake Forest has already blown games to Notre Dame, Georgia Tech, and Virginia Tech recently. Uh, they're playing Clemson. Jeff, anything on that or just stay away from it? Yeah, I mean, Wake desperately needs a win. Um, they've been way better at home, obviously. But then again, I mean, have they? I mean, they, they lost last time out against Georgia Tech. Game was closed. Probably could have went either way. They need to find a way to get the job done here. It seems like they've been on a, a two-week uh, bender since that win against uh, Duke. Uh, they, it's, nothing's been the same since then. That's the only the only thing they have right now. I mean, they have other losses as well to Florida State uh, and to NC State, none of whom are in the tournament right now to go along with Virginia Tech and then awful losses to Notre Dame and to Georgia Tech. I mean, you're almost at the point where Wake Forest has got to win the tournament to get into the NCAA tournament. What's Clemson uh, playing here? What's Clemson yeah, exactly. playing for here, though? Uh, exactly. They're basically locked into the three spot. What do they have to play for? It sounds like stay away, stay away on that. Uh, Parlay Pat watching, interested in Baylor, Texas Tech. End of the year in the Big 12. Baylor, obviously, the big win over Texas midweek. Any thought on Baylor, Texas Tech coming up in the Big 12? I'm looking for my number. You guys may have that. Texas Tech minus two. Yeah, I mean, Tech's really just been hit hard with injuries. I just They haven't been the same team with War Washington on the mend. I like the over here. I know Baylor's been playing slower this in conference, uh, playing more zones. So they're sometimes they get caught in these slogs. But when they want to get out and run, we've seen them put up 80, 90 and give up 80, 90 other and two. I think Texas Tech with the way they're playing profiling more as an over team, different Grant McCaslin group this year, not the old tech, not the old North Texas um, shell like rock fight type teams. I think there's a lot of points, 150 uh, and over. I think this, this gets there. This uh, anything on that there, big man. Uh, on Baylor, Texas Tech, or you want to move on? Yeah, I was hoping this game would come up. I'm going to play Baylor here uh, on the money oh. line. I think they beat. <laughs> I think they beat Texas Tech. I just. I think Matt made a great point. I just don't think this is the same Texas Tech team defensively, and we have seen Baylor just erupt over the last game or two against yes. pretty good competition. This team is starting to play really well at the right time. Uh, we know they're good on offense, and I think they kind of slice and dice a Texas Tech team that really, I think, is just looking forward to to where they're going to go next in a Big 12 tournament. We've seen Baylor just kind of really focused, and I like the fact that, you know, I think for them, they've been pretty solid defensively, too. I know Texas kind of got away from Baylor, but all in all, they've been pretty damn good recently. I like what I'm seeing out of them. Uh, what, what are we having a number in this game? Can someone verify? Two. Looks like two. Are you taking the money line? Or do you Baylor's want to laying the... two. Yeah. No, no, Baylor's getting two, I think. Uh, do you yeah. want the two? Sorry. I'll take the two, yeah. I, I like so, Baylor here. I think they win. So the big man will take Baylor on the live play. Live button again. I I've lost track. Are you up to 17 live button plays again today Let's on the show? Let's keep it live going. We only have a couple button, more minutes. Live yeah. button for Jeff Nadu. They did win the most recent matchup with Texas Tech. That was at home, 79-73, did the Baylor Bears. That game is tonight on ESPN2 from Lubbock. Um, that is at 5 local time in Lubbock tonight on ESPN2 for that one. couple of more minutes, couple of more questions. We're staying here on Saturday. That was the fifth live pick, I'm, I'm being told, or the fifth pick overall. I think four of them live so far for Jeff Nadu. They're keeping track in the back uh, right now. I may have one more live play before we're done, and we may get Matt Cox. If we stay here long enough, if we stay here to like 1 Eastern time, we may get Matt, Matt Cox to live let's play. Let's go then. We got more games. You yeah. never know. Uh, e let's see. Easy Baby 1988. We go all over the board. He said his thoughts on Wagner and Central Connecticut. Central Connecticut laying the 6.5. Anything on that at all, guys? Does that make you – well? Does that I'll, make? Yeah, I'll say this: both these games were decided by board. one at all. 
Yeah, both these games were decided by one point in the regular season. Uh, Wagner's played tough under Donald Copeland. You got to figure it probably translates again to another close game. I mean, both were really good. Both were, he came down to the wire. Six, six and a half seems a little high, but it's not a conference I really bet much. Pass. Matt Cox, want to stay away? Uh, I kind of like Wagner. They've been playing better. They uh, thought they'd be better in the regular season. Ton of injuries, playing better. A uh, ton of talent. I think they're deceptively talented for this conference. It's all relative, of course, but I think they do have talent. Dean watching says thoughts on CUSA game Liberty laying four and a half with Western Kentucky. Conference USA tournament not until next weekend in Huntsville, Alabama. Liberty laying four and a half. Thoughts? Anything, guys, on that? Nah, pass for me. Pass. Uh, Matt yeah, Cox? slightly into the, the tops here. I just think the home teams uh, in this conference, Conference USA, have just been a lot better this year. So uh, just on that alone with the way they're playing, very big pace clash here. Uh, one of the faster teams in the country against one of the slower, more methodical teams, too. Fair enough. Real quick, let's talk Mountain West. We know Boise State won last night. They have a chance now to maybe be in a tie for the one spot, the one seed. My understanding is Utah State, I believe, wins all the tiebreakers. Utah State can win the conference outright if they get a win in their matchup uh, this evening. Also interested is Nevada. Utah State playing New Mexico. If they win, they win the conference. They win the number one seed. That game at 6.30 local time in Logan, Utah on CBS Sports Network. Nevada is playing later in the night at uh, 7.30 Pacific time against UNLV. Significance again, guys, if Utah State loses and Nevada wins, we got a three-way tiebreaker between Boise State, Utah State, and Nevada. And it's important for the number one seed on when you play, what time of day you play in the Mountain West tournament, and also possible better matchup on whatever happens. My understanding, though, is that in a two-way tie with Boise State, Utah State gets it, and if it's a three-way tie, I believe they get it also. So more than likely, they've locked up the number one seed here right now because Utah State's 13-4, and four, but still something to play for for Nevada, and Utah State has to play tough against New Mexico, and New Mexico needs this game tonight. All right, any thought on Utah State laying three and a half with New Mexico? First of all, anything there, Matt Cox? I think the Lobos get them. Lobos play well at Nevada a couple weeks back. I know they've been really reeling lately, but um, I, I feel like this is a game they rise to the occasion, get a crazy win in a crazy environment at the Spectrum. Jeff, any thought on that? Utah State, New Mexico. New Mexico needs it. Resume builder. Yeah, first lean's over, I guess. You know, I don't look at either of these teams as defensive stalwarts by any means. Uh, I don't know that uh, you know Utah State can stop New Mexico's guards, and I don't know that you know New Mexico can stop Great Osibor. So yeah, lean over, first to eighty wins. Uh, and again, for the second game, uh, Nevada is laying four and a half with UNLV, who also needs this game maybe for some at-large resume building. That one, again, at 7.30 Pacific time, Nevada and UNLV could be a three-way tie in the Mountain West. Boise State's already there at 13 and 15. Let's see what happens on that. Uh, a couple more viewer questions, then we're going to get out of here. I may have one more live button play before we're gone. Uh, Matthew says, interested in UCF, Texas Christian, TCU. TCU, the seven-point favorite at home. I know Jeff hates the Frogs. We know you're not weighing in on TCU. Matt Cox, anything on TCU? Uh, no, I don't trust the Horn Frogs now. They have bad rim protection. They can't defend the middle, even though that's sort of what Dixon's MO has been. So, again, kind of like Texas Tech, a Big 12 team with an identity crisis. Uh, I can't trust them under any circumstance right now. And Jeff is a pass. Stay well, away on that. Actually, no hold on. No? No? You said the number seven and a half, which, you know, uh, g- give me UCF. And I'm going to tell you why. <laughs> I've told you guys on this show. <laughs> no, listen. It's not funny. Listen. UCF no, I'm hangs. laughing at the live button nonchalant. Give me UCF. Go. They hang in every game. What What are we doing here? TCU, like, as Matt said, can't guard the rim. UCF's tough. They play good defense. They generally hang in every game they play. Look, are they, the, you know, a great team in this conference? No. I think they're getting there. They're competing in these games. And I look at TCU and think to myself, you know, what are they really playing for here? I mean... I guess you could talk about senior day, but, I mean, most right. of the kids here weren't original TCU recruits. Seven and a half seems a bit high. Again, I like UCF. I like the way they defend. It seems like they care at that end. 
Give me TC, uh, UCF plus a seven and a half against TCU. Live button play once again late in the show. If I'm not mistaken, that's five of them for you. Again, we're going to have to have extra space on the bet, best bets page to be able to see that. Uh, unreal. We got to go here in a moment or two. Um, I am going to talk about this. This is coming up at noon Eastern time. Memphis needs the game at Florida Atlantic. I'm not going to mess with the line here. I don't know that FAU doesn't win this game as a close game. Again, Memphis, it would be a quad one win at Florida Atlantic. It ends the regular season. Interesting for FAU. They're trying to lock up the two seed, which means they wouldn't play South Florida until the championship game. I'm looking at that total on the bet us line what did i see for noon eastern time for uh memphis um that total where is that total i lost it there a second ago i think i'm gonna play the over 162 give me a live button kevin on memphis florida atlantic score 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 that's the little gym in boca raton that seats about 2500 people i think there's tons of points today for Memphis and Florida Atlantic, noon Eastern time, CBS, both motivated to win, both motivated to score. Live button, Memphis, Florida Atlantic, over. We love it. Um, great stuff uh, here uh, with all these. Do we have time for one more? Gabe is watching uh, as well. Gabe wants to know about the Missouri Valley Drake Bradley semifinal game. Thoughts on Drake? against Bradley in that matchup. I see Drake is, what, a two-point favorite, two or two-and-a-half-point favorite. Any thoughts on that? That's the second game up tonight. Bradley and Drake in St. Louis on the neutral floor. Any thought, Jeff? Uh, yeah, I mean, Drake won both games. I don't think much changes here. Seems like a, a close game, though. It's Missouri Valley. I definitely lean Drake. Matt Cox, anything under on this one? Under, under, under. Points are impossible in the Arch Madness cavernous arena i don't get why but no yes uh indiana state northern iowa up first that one at 2 30 local time in st louis and uh, then drake and bradley right after that my lord i think we gave you a ton uh on this all right let's get to it best bets i know we got to get out of here in just a second man we've had a ton of games and i can't even keep track of all of nadu's best bets all of his live plays look at that over there uh on the right uh, James Madison laying points, Kentucky taking the points. He then went South Florida. He went Baylor. He went UCF. Barrage. Matt Cox has one play. That's Furman. Host goes two live button plays. Duke in revenge. Remember Shire 4-0 last year in ACC revenge. It's revenge tonight against North Carolina. And give me points, points, points coming up at noon with the alma mater, Memphis and Florida Atlantic. Boys, we got to go. Matt Cox, final thought for this Saturday, final regular season Saturday uh, for a lot of schools. Final thought? Go Owls. I, uh, I'm sorry about your Tigers. I think they lose today, TJ. We shall see. Jeff Nadu, final thought. Yeah, I still got a girl sleeping in my bed. I got to go. <laughs> I'll see you all later. Thank you. Let's get, it, let's get it today. Kevin, everybody behind the scenes. Francisco and Ignacio, everybody behind the scenes. Danny, great job. We'll see you Monday at 11 a.m. Good luck with all the plays. Enjoy all the action from the Bet US TV College Basketball Show. Thanks for joining in. Don't forget to like our video. If you don't want to miss our next show, make sure to ring our bell and subscribe. For all our sports content, head to BetUSTV.com. See you next time.